for those of us who teach and do research or on the other side of knowledge work, I'm sure you will agree with me that if we are truly to commit to rethinking the nature of knowledge, what we teach, how we teach it, what we go about teaching, how we engage in our professional uh, practices, uh, and also the ways in which we think about knowledge and how we go about acquiring knowledge, that there's no doubt that there's much insight that we can glean from the voices of students. And this process of engaging and talking and co-constructing uh, and thinking about knowledge work and the ethics and politics of knowledge and knowledge production, when done in this kind of way, can be troublesome, can be uncomfortable, can be disruptive, but it's a necessary kind of discomfort and, and, um, and disruption that I think we need to engage with. So I'm really, really hoping that the students who are here with us this afternoon are going to uh, create discomfort and disrupt in the kind of way that um, is, is truly going to open up a space for the kind of active and authentic engagement that I know Copano and others are seeking here today. So thank you very much. Um, it, it appears that we only have the three of you joining us. Um, so Nomzamo, I'm going to introduce, I'm going to introduce all of you and ask you to, to just dive in there. Um, Nomzamo, are you here? No. So maybe if I can get my papers together. Um, right, Sanele, while at Wits University, uh, was an active member of SASCO and served in various leadership structures, including the SRC as the residence officer. Um, Sesesaki, um, during his time at Rhodes, ha held various positions. He served two terms on the Independent Electro Electoral Board of the University and also as SRC president for a period of time. And finally, we have an M. Sykes student from UWC, um, Ketemutse. 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 Welcome. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you and let's start this interesting conversation that we're all looking forward to. Okay, um, I'll start, I'm Zanele Mozepe, and as a it takes me back to student days, and I'm tempted to open with Amanda. <laughs> Amanda, I wait too? Okay, so that speaks to the power of the people, and the will that we have as Africans, is to speak to us. I want to start by saying a, just a quote, it says, um, Look to the left and look to the right. The person on either side would not make it. This was said to a class that was predominantly black working class. The statement was heavy because it clearly stated that a person like me would not make it. The most potent weapon in the arms, in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. That, is, that professor had captured our minds which was a win for him. This was when I was in first year in the English class, and I sat there and I was told, look to the left, I saw a black woman, look to the right, I saw a black man. And he said, none of us. I was also on the side of them, so it meant at some point perhaps I wouldn't make it. These words haunted me for the next couple of years, and as I came to realize that this institution was designed to exclude me, the institutional autonomy cemented in my head this was a European institution in an African setting. It further cemented that I, as a teacher, was perhaps designed to fail. I made it to fourth year, obviously, and I remember seeing Prof, and I said to him, Prof, look to the left, look to the right. I am here, and I made it. Was I taught on Africa or African? The answer is a sad, loud no. I was not. I was taught that cry the beloved country was not about apartheid. My mind was constantly, was constantly conflict because 
it was it was a setting it was set in the apartheid times and the main characters lives were disrupted by the apartheid laws so how could the book not be about apartheid i was taught western literature folk tales i remember in class shakespeare's which did not recognize they didn't recognize african authors writers such as miriam tlale bessie head biko zeksmda we came to know them through sasco political schools etc so for us or for me i learned about these great black minds in sasco if i did not go into sasco i guess or pya structures i wouldn't have known i would have continued in this western thinking i then realized that well i also realized that white males were responsible for knowledge production if anyone who says this is about race of course it's about race of course it's about race race is being what you see when looking at who's more advanced and at whose expense class is what we see or hear when you pronounce management and management or determine or determine gender is what you see as society classifies men and women i later did a course in isizulu funny enough i was actually enrolled to do afrikaans uh purely because that was the language the second language i did in high school so i mean it made sense to then just continue in afrikaans i did um and i was afraid to do isizulu amazingly because it was difficult i mean i spoke isizulu how can it be difficult how can it be difficult for me to learn the language that i knew very well it speaks to who's in charge of curriculum and who seeks to favor after failing the first semester i went to isizulu how shameful of me and i failed afrikaans i think i remember first test i got 46 and what kicked in for me was i'm in fourth year i need to to graduate because i have a family waiting so there was no way afrikaans was going to be my my obstacle it has been for many years then i shifted in suzulu which i was afraid of similarly because i've been taught that our indigenous languages are scary i mean we speak it every day amongst ourselves but it was a scary thought then i went to suzulu it was an interesting department the suzulu department was headed by a white man who taught third uh, third language how absurd is that on the contrary you'd never find a black african being an hod of an english department for obvious reasons a man who has a language consequently possesses the world expressed and implied by that language that's what fanon said this to, this to me speaks to the constant undermining of our languages and the idea that universities uh, do not have black capable equally intellectual uh, people of color or africans to actually head up these departments during school experience because I, i was doing teaching we would then go into classes for three for three weeks and during exper uh, experiences or they call it practicals the pedagogy uh, shifts black students into white culture it divides us from black lived experiences the practical experience were designed to take place in functioning white schools or ex modesty schools uh, schools which was a false sense of experience because after four years one would then be employed in rural or township schools so what we did as young teachers would quit and go and seek functioning schools because you are not trained you are not equipped to deal with the so-called dysfunctional schools because our rural schools and township schools are perceived as hopeless centers of learning therefore if i'm told constantly or i am trained to constantly deal with that i mean like being a teacher and then i get there there's no resources as never taught how to actually get into a class and be faced with these things this obviously has a ripple effect inside our schools or into our classroom so as an educator i advocate for western ideas and dismiss african ideas purely because we have never been taught or even debated we then continue to this day and age to teach the russian revolution Cecil John Rhodes uh colonial expansions these are all in the history curriculum in 2017 european expansions why why we are raising our own african intellects we are, we are raising our own thinkers our own ideas we then teach 
If we're going to do the history or touch on apartheid, we then teach a cushy history on colonialism and civilization, and not the fact that it was an evil system that landed us as a black people to dispossession, segregation, landlessness, and so forth. Therefore, I, as a young person, I do support the call to decolonize the mind first, because for me, the look to the left, look to the right, somehow was dealing with my mindset in the next four years of this institution. I support the call to decolonize the mind and education where we are taught the richness of Africa, its many cultures and languages. We need to be taught about black inventors. I mean, they call him the please call me guy, but he's actually in Kosala. He came up with the concept of please call me in our phones, but he had to fight in the courts to make sure that it was our, his idea because it's, there's always this narrative that a black person can never be an inventor. A black person can never sit in intellectual spaces and succeed. Um, we need to be taught about intellectuals that have been raised, where we are taught about our forefathers as agents of change, as powerful beings, as chiefs, and not the negative narratives on slavery. Yes, we were slaved, but I don't think all those forefathers agreed to slavery. And you're telling me at no point that they ever decide to revolt. That's the history we want to hear. And also, we need to be, t to be taught not only on slavery, and as a defeated nation, we should never be taught that. In fact, our curriculum now, it needs to teach us that the black child can think, the black child can do, and is equal. I mean, this is a platform for everyone to, to come up and speak. So I strongly believe that it also starts in the curriculum. When you decolonize the mind, meaning whatever it is that I'm thinking, I do better. And then that ripple effect starts to, to actually show in our curriculum, in our spaces. With that, I thank you.